Jay Papazan, good morning. Welcome to the Success 101 podcast. Such an honor to have you on. How are things today? They're fabulous. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you on and your book. Uh, I'm sure so many people tell you this, but your book has just been a game changer for me. I hate to say it, I haven't mastered the whole time blocking thing and really getting it down to the one thing, but the message <laughs> that you guys share in that book is so crucial. And the main reason I wanted to fight like crazy to get you on here, I know your schedule is crazy busy, but I'm so fortunate to have you here. And I think you're going to give a lot of just great insight and wisdom to our listeners here today before we dive into the practical stuff. And before we dive into the book, for those out there who don't know you and don't know your backstory, I'd love you to go back as far as you want to. Tell us how you got to where you are today, what the motivation and inspiration was that led you to the man you are today, and just fill in some of those blanks there for us, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. And if it makes you feel any better, I'm now eight years into this one thing journey and I'm still failing all the time, right? It's always <laughs> a work in progress. That is so always good a work hear. in progress. <laughs> oh yeah. Success is just a long line of failures where you don't quit. I think that's a Zig Ziglar or it sounds oh, yeah, like yeah. him at least. Absolutely. So um, I grew up in Memphis and, you know, I have a father who's an executive. My mom um, was an artist and a dental hygienist and you know, we just always grew up, you know, no strangers to hard work around our house, but I always had an affinity for books and writing. It was my hobby. It was, you know, I just always had a book in my hands from about sixth grade on. It was just, it's great to see my kids doing that as well. I think I tried to write my first book when I was 12. I borrowed my mom's typewriter, put it on a card table in my room and did my own kind of mashup slash rip off of Conan the Barbarian and The Hobbit. Um, it's just, you know, like those early instincts I wanted to write, you know, I love books and I wanted to go there. I wrote short stories in high school, passed them around the lunch table, became an English major, went on, got a master's degree after a brief sojourn in France, met my wife, moved to Austin, and I'd been an editor in New York for about six years, got to work on some great best-selling works there and had some really great mentors in the publishing world, most notably a guy named David Hershey. Um, who was just a master at what he did. And then when I moved here to Austin, there was no big publishing. And long story short, um, I took a job just trying to write at my wife's counsel. She said, you should jump on the other side of the fence and took a job at a sleepy little real estate company called Keller Williams. Right. And back then in 2000, there were about maybe 6,000 agents in the company. And I was newsletter writer one for the tech team. <laughs> and that's where I met Gary Keller, my co-author on The One Thing. And I heard that he was writing a book. I hit him up in the bathroom. It was really small. There's like 27 employees back then. I ran into him, said, I hear you're trying to write a book. Um, do you remember that I used to be in publishing? And he kind of looked at me cockeyed, said, why don't you come in my office and laid out a vision to write 13 books. And when he started putting out some of his favorite nonfiction books, two of them were books I'd worked on. One was a book called Body for Life by Bill Phillips. And the other one was uh, Go for the Goal by Mia Hamm. And when I showed him my name in the acknowledgments, it was pretty much within a week, we were writing our first book together. Wow. And it's been a great journey. We've now published like 2.6 million books. I mean, we've had books that have sold 2.6 million copies. Now, I know your relationship with Gary is very unique in the sense that, you know, the story you just shared, I mean, who so many business stories start off either in, you know, some strange connection or, you know, somebody says something and it catches the ear of somebody else and then suddenly they're off to the races, right? I mean, your story is, is similar to that. You mentioned that to him. Usually it's in a bar or a lunch or at a golf course, not in a bathroom. But yes, that's, that's right. usually it's an encounter where people go. You do this, don't you? And then, boom, that something sparks and a connection is made. Yeah, that's exactly what I was getting to there is this, this such a unique story taken even a step further in a men's bathroom, right? I mean, so, so you guys made that connection <laughs> there. You walk into his office. He lays out these books. Uh, you had some experience in publishing at that time, as you mentioned. I'm not sure what his experience was, but if he had 13 ideas for books, maybe he's ahead of the game there. Many people, you know, you see, you know, they say, I want to go write a book. I want to produce an album. I want to do whatever. And you're just like... Yeah, there's not the talent's not there, right? I mean, so did you see early on a, a real gifting he had for writing? Were his books, you know, were his books the type that you just thought, man, I really need to get on this? Or did you just see it as like, hey, I'll help where I can? Or, or what was real, the real vision there whenever you saw that? Well, I mean, it's everything's clear in hindsight. One, it's very, very, very unique to have someone have a vision for 13 books. You know, you talk about J.K. Rowling 
had envisioned the entire Harry Potter series before she wrote the first one. I've heard that story a million times, and Gary thinks in terms of franchises, right? So he wasn't going to write a book. He was going to write a franchise of books. And the first book he wanted to write was a book called The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, and he was going to model it on The Millionaire Next Door and a couple of other books. And I remember when he laid out the vision, I said, well, how many people sell real estate? And he goes, oh, a little less than a million. And I told him, I mean, this was my job, you know, working for David Hershey and some other editors in New York was to figure out what was the market for the titles that were proposed to us. I said, you know, you could probably do okay, but it's kind of a niche book. I didn't think it would sell more than 50,000 copies. So I didn't see the opportunity to write a real estate book with him as a massive, I didn't see it as the opportunity it was at the time, but I did see it as an opportunity to not be writing a newsletter. I mean, I was going to get back to books. I was going to get to work with the founder and chairman of the board of a company. And it just seemed like a great, fun project to be a part of. You know, that book went on and it still sells 30, 40,000 copies a year. And it sold over a million copies since we first published it in 2003. So my estimation of the market for that book was way low. And I had no idea that when Gary thinks about writing, he wants to write something that's timeless. It doesn't matter the topic. And he's always like, I'd rather be timeless than timely. And I think that's another thing that a lot of people are rushing out trying to catch a fad, or they're trying to catch the moment or time the market as an investors. And he's almost always looking at a bigger picture. And I know that you've heard some of the other interviews I've done, like the number one thing, if you pulled my wife and me, we, you interrogated us in separate rooms, we would be on the same script. The number one gift of getting to work with Gary Keller has been that he has role modeled and he has pushed us to think bigger about every aspect of our lives. And right there in the beginning, oh, I want to write 13 books. Most people are like, I have an idea for a book. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to that point, Jim Rohn, we've heard it over and over. Not who you have. You're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. And people hear that and they go, oh, yeah. oh, cool phrase. And they move on. It's absolutely true. And by your wisdom that you're gaining from him and you have gained from him since you guys partnered up, I know that's a big part of your story. As we get ready to segue into the one thing here that I just want to dive and just rip that thing all apart here for our listeners this morning. But as we get ready to segue into that, let's start a little broader. What is the biggest way besides the things you just mentioned there about, you know, him creating just a bigger vision for the things he's going into, you know, not just one book, but a franchise of books. It's a gifting that people have, but also something people can cultivate with a bigger vision if they work at it over time. How has he really yes. helped you think bigger on many aspects of life, whether it be the business world, whether it be just your own personal relationships or your routines and rituals? Let's start there in the big vision and how he's helped you. And then we'll dive in and use that as a segue into narrowing down to the one thing as we get into that. Well, that's easy. You know, when Gary wrote an essay for one of our courses called The Power of One, it was aimed at real estate. It was like five pages long. I mean, I knew immediately when I read it, I said, wow, this is a book and this is Gary's book. Because the ideas that we talk about in the book, the fundamental ideas, you know, we really refined them through five years of research for this book. But that was his game plan. You know, it's like you focus, you need to figure out what matters most and you give it everything you've got and you're going to be the last person to quit when everybody else is going on and getting distracted and doing other things. If you really want to succeed, you're going to push the number one priority farther than anyone else. And so it's just the things that we'll talk about with the book are almost universally things that he either demanded I do, right? Because if we're going to work together, this is how we work together. Or sure. he just pushed me to do. So it's almost total alignment, Jared. I, mean, I just got to tell you, he time blocks. He always has. He called it time blocking long before we wrote this book. And he's been incredibly focused in narrowing it down to this month, this week, this year. What is the number one priority for me, for my company, for my family? He's always noodled through that. And usually around this time of year, he will send me a piece of notebook paper from his notebook where he's journaled out exactly what his intentions are for this year based on his five and longer year vision. So he's always been that kind of person. We just kind of put it into a framework so that other people could do it. I don't want to put y'all's relationship and what he's imparted to you in a box here, but I, I may seem to do that whenever I ask this question, but I really do want to know the answer to this. Would you say time blocking sure. is one of the biggest things that he's taught you in the scope of everything that you've learned from him? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's a thing that is so easy 
for us to say, this year I'm going to, or this week I'm going to. But where the rubber hits the road is when you put time on the task. And it's very easy for us to state our intentions and overestimate our ability to achieve them in the free time we might have and underestimate how much time it'll take to achieve them. So that methodical, kind of boring success process of looking at your goals and looking at your calendar and asking, do I have enough time on my number one priority? It's a pretty simple process. You know, people get disappointed. They think it should be more complicated. Where's the app? Where's the technology? <laughs> right. It's not complicated. It's just not easy. So, Jay, let's go ahead and segue into the book, The One Thing, uh, just wildly successful book. If you've been any in any airports, if you've been in anywhere, Amazon, anything like that, you've probably seen this book. Otherwise, you live under a rock, maybe. But if we can push more traffic and attention that way, I think it's going to be great for the listeners. This thing, it just spoke so much to me because I feel like I'm a very disciplined person until when, until what? I'm not very disciplined, right? That it's like, well, am I really that disciplined of a person or am I disciplined thinking I'm disciplined until, you know, things come up, right? And I think we could all say that a little bit. You said you've been working on this for eight years and you're still trying to master getting down to that idea of the one thing. And I love a phrase that I heard from you at one point. You said, we can do one thing more, we can do one thing with more effect than many things with side effects. But my question to you, and I think what other people would want to know is how do we really do that? I know I'm in a super active role each day. So many of my listeners are as well. They may see your book and go, man, the one thing, okay, there's busyness, there's kids, there's work, there's obligations. How do we really start narrowing it down to that one thing and put it into practical real life progress? Sure. I mean, at the heart of the book is a question that we call the focusing question. And if you've got show notes, maybe you can include it there so that if someone's driving or jogging, they don't have to try to memorize it. But I'll, I'll say it a couple of times. I'll link it all up in show notes here. First, great. So it's what's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary. So if you break that down, it's a long kind of story behind it. But it's a question that came out of Gary's coaching relationships with his top business associates and his frustration that they would often get a lot done, but not the most important thing. And, you know, he would say, you know, all right, so what are you going to get done this week? And they come back having done their third, fourth, and fifth priorities, but not their one and two. And so out of frustration, and frankly, a little, you know, maybe a little anger, parental anger, he started narrowing it down. You know, be like, Jared, if you can only get two things done this week, if you only get three things done this week, and they still often would miss the mark. So what's the one thing I can do is the first giant leap he took forward and getting results with the people he was working with. You know, when you ask a question and there's only one answer, it really narrows your focus by default. And it's what I can do, not could do, would do, or should do. And it's what you can do right now. A lot of people will talk about what they might be able to do in the future. You need to focus on what you can do today. And what he discovered when he just started asking just that simple question, you know, what's the one thing you're going to get done between now and the next coaching session? One, everybody did it because there's no place to hide when you just have <laughs> right. one thing on your priority list. You can't say, but I did this, this, and this. You did it or you didn't. And there's ultimate accountability in that amount of clarity. And the reality is when people did the number one thing, they almost always did all the other junk anyway. So it's like they're in the, you know, caught up in the airstream behind a Big Mac truck, right? You know, there's almost little, all the extra stuff gets kind of pulled along behind it if you just do the most important thing. The second half is such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary is kind of referring to Pareto's principle. This idea that, you know, 20% of what we do gets us 80% of our results. So whatever we choose, we want it to be something that has magnified results. It's got a real lever system applied to it. You know, in, in almost any sales position, your one thing for that business is going to be to ask for business. Whatever marketing or prospecting you do, that's almost always the lead domino, right? That's the number one thing that you want to be accomplishing. Right. As a writer, I got to read books and write books, right? So most people know the answer, but because we're so busy scurrying around doing all this other stuff, we don't stop to ask it write down the answer or get real clear about what our priority is. And, you know, in my experience, and I've done, I've spoken in front of audiences, it's probably in the tens, if not hundreds of thousands now. And most people know their answer and they feel a little guilty for not doing it. So it's not that you don't know the answer, it's that you're not asking the question. 
Absolutely. You talked about magnifying results. I think if you polled anybody that's in a highly active world that I'm in, that you're speaking to, any entrepreneur, business person, peak performance, or someone striving for maximum potential, you know, to reach that place each day, if you ask them, do you want to do the things that magnify results? 10 out of 10 people would say, resoundingly, absolutely. Here's what I find interesting, though, and I would love your thoughts on this, Jay. In today's world, in 2016, we're all adults out there, right? I mean, most people that are hearing this, right, that we're going to be adults, right? But structuring your day comes with so much stress for so many people. Why is something that should be so easy and simple and make our lives better and help us hit those magnifying results, why is it that it brings so much stress for two people that are smart, they're wise, they're business partners, maybe leading a company or whatever, or running their own company, very smart, intelligent people. Some people can get it, the minority, I would think, and the majority of people say, look, man, it's really hard for me to organize my time. Why is this seemingly simple thing so tough for wise people out there to really get down and master? You know, that's a great question. I don't think I've ever been asked it that way. And the answer, I believe, is habits. I think you look up and I think you shared you're in your mid-30s. I'm in, I can still save my mid-40s for like one more year, right? But we, <laughs> right. at this point, are this like, you know, gnarly ball of wound up habits that we've created since our youth. And so behavior change in any area, right, is always difficult. So when you look at your schedule and how you are managing your time today, you're probably doing 90% of that unconsciously, right? Because you're, you've been working right. on some game plan that worked for you going back a long time. So I think fundamentally, when you look at your calendar and want to simplify it, it's a process of undoing behaviors to get to a new game plan. So that transition for most people is the hardest part. The idea of doing one new thing isn't hard. It's just now, how do I make clear space to do my one thing? Because I've got all this baggage that I've built up around myself. That's a great, great answer. And habits are another one of those things that people, I just find, I'm a coach, uh, you know, financial advisor by trade. I coach my advisors here. I coach uh, private clients that I have speaking to people all over the place. And I hear the same thing from so many people is that habits, whereas we all would admit, just like magnifying results, 10 out of 10, right? They would say, I want to magnify my results. 10 out of 10 people would say, I want to change my habits. But I think we hear that so often that habits almost just become this non, it's just like this cliche word that just doesn't have a lot of meaning behind it. People know that changing their habits would be good, but I think they just don't even know where to start. So they get a book like yours, it's like the one thing, okay, great. And I think a lot of times they think it's that easy button, right? Like I've heard a lot about this book, I'm gonna read it and it's gonna tell me the one thing I need to do. In their mind, they're thinking easy, you know, let's simplify it. And, and even though it does, I think what you're trying to say though in, in your message in the book is, let's do the most important thing, but that then is gonna ripple out and make everything so much easier. Just uh, as I've heard many times before, you talk about dominoes and how we knock over one domino we line them up in such a way that we knock over a domino to where hopefully everything else falls right in line you got it. behind it. But yeah, habits, I mean, it's you just one it. of those things where if we could just figure that out, we'd be a lot better off. And I think people want to get to whatever their sense of protect, perfection is way too fast. So a phrase that Gary's been saying for as long as I've known him is that really successful people tend to have a great day before noon. So for one thing, you don't have to be disciplined all the time. It's just a few hours a day and what happens when you are launching your day with a period of productivity, you know, we've started calling it the halo effect. You know, we have a course called Time Blocking Mastery that we've taken probably 500 people through. And I'll coach someone in the beginning, right, this transition. If you have to just start with five minutes a day, let's start there. And let's have success and build on that success. And what I've observed, and now, I, like I said, just over 500 people we've been able to watch closely in this process is that when people establish kind of a beachhead, right? Like a, use a military theme, right? You're invading the nation, you know, so, and, and it's Normandy. If you can establish Normandy Beach, you now have an entry place into the rest of your calendar. And so when people are successful, like for me, I'm now 90 days into uh, a meditation habit, which was really, I failed like four times before I got it. <laughs> and I was really trying hard. And I'm just doing three minutes a day, man. I mean, three minutes. You think, well, how can you not find three minutes? Oh, well, because sure. my day's already full. And so, yeah. well, I'll just do this one thought. I'm sorry, we we're both trying to speak. But the, the three minutes a day, people will do that 10, 15, maybe 30 minutes and when they establish control over one tiny sliver of their calendar, it gives them the confidence to take the next piece and the next piece. 
That's what I've observed. So I tell people, start small, but aim high, right? So think really, really big, but start small. And I think we say that in the book in, in another way. You know, you want to think big, but act small. You really want to be really focused. And you, if in the beginning, it's just five or 10 minutes, take control and learn how that happens. And then over a period of months, you can start claiming back more of your days. Oh, that's great advice. And I think for most people out there uh, would, would agree with this, sometimes just the starting. You know, if you say, hey, it's three minutes of a meditation practice, how in the world can you not just implement that in and get it down, right? It's, there's so many more factors that go into that, whether it's starting something that may be hard work that we're avoiding at our job that we know we need to dive into, but we go find a lot of other things. If you start small, I would think that you would agree with me that starting small helps you to just start, right? And for so many people, that is the biggest step to the change in their life that they need is just starting. Uh, Tal Ben Shahar, great uh, Harvard professor out there, talks a lot about time management and those sort of things. I just love his phrase, the five minute takeoff. If you've got anything that you're just dreading doing, you know you have to do it or it'd be good for you. You're dreading doing it though. Take a five minute takeoff, set your timer for five minutes and just go. Don't think, don't prepare, yep. just go. And I think for so many people, just starting is something they know they need to do, but your advice to start small and just start is going to help to ripple out into those magnifying results that we're, that we're looking for. Uh, yeah, there's so many places we could go. I mean, this time of year, around the beginning of the year, people are doing these crazy New Year's resolutions. And what they don't realize is they're biting off this huge thing. They'll say like, oh, I really want to get in shape, right? I want to look good in my bathing suit. Right. And what they don't realize is they're taking on like 10 habits, right? They're going to eat better, which means they have to first shop differently, prepare their food differently, eat smaller portions, eat at different times of the day. It's like five different things they're actually winding into each other. And then they're going to work out too, which means they probably have to go to bed earlier and get up earlier and go to the gym and pack a gym bag every day. So just start with one thing. You know, a lot of people, I think if they would just get up an hour earlier, they could immediately buy the time that they needed to do so many of the things they don't get to do today. Write that novel, read a book for themselves, exercise, do yoga, meditate. And I just say, instead of saying, I'm going to start meditating in the morning, why don't you just start by setting your clock back 30 minutes earlier every day and practice getting up earlier until that's a habit and then add in the activities. I mean, it sounds so stupid, simple, but people are <laughs> impatient. They want to get to the end. And because they do two or three things at once, that's when they undo themselves. Yeah, it's just, it's our society. And sometimes it's the demands our society puts on us today, just because everybody's in that same, you know, sheep mentality. The sheep are just following each other around everything. Everybody wants stuff now. They want it fast, but they're not thinking about how easy this really could be. The, the longer I get into my profession here as a financial advisor, the more I realize as a, in, and as a business owner, I just realize things are just way more simple if I let them be simpler and sometimes if I allow them to not be so complex, if that makes sense. I can let things be a lot more complex than it has to be if we will just reframe our mind this year and don't set all these New Year's resolutions. I mean, the, normally those things lead to more depression than anything studies show, right? But actually <laughs> reframe your brain to where you're just thinking about it differently and you're not allowing things to be so complex. Even if it seems super complex on the outside, peel those layers back and go, man, this really isn't that hard of a deal. If I set my alarm for 30 minutes earlier each morning, that's not tough, right? I mean, look at how much more I could get done. So I think that's phenomenal advice. Jay, I hadn't prepared to do this, but I would love to give you two different, you know, for those out there listening who might feel a little bit stuck going, man, I've tried these time blocking coaching things that I read online, or I read a book once, or I did this or did that. I've tried so many things. I'm just stuck. I don't even know where to start because nothing's worked before. I'd love to give you two scenarios of people. Okay. And these sure. are going to be what I consider my main listening audience would fall somewhere into these lines, no matter what your profession or your age is. I would say some sort of highly active person that probably feels overwhelmed each day, that's making good strides as they get a little bit older because they've learned from their failures and they've used that as feedback, but they're making good strides, but they're still not where they want to be, or they feel a little bit stuck. But here's the two scenarios. Number one is going to be the majority of people out there, I would think. They hear this message, they read your book, whatever. And they go, man, I've got too many things going on that I really can't design my day to where I can just focus on getting that one monumental thing done. So that's kind of the first thought in their mind, my, maybe a naysayer or someone that's thinking of it a little bit negatively. The other person on the other side of that would be the person that says, hey, I've really, I've really honed into this one thing idea 
But when I start really trying to focus on the one thing, the dominoes aren't falling in line for me. I'm not drafting off of the back of the truck, as you said. What I'm finding is life around me starts getting more chaotic because I'm focusing so much on this one thing idea that I'm letting a lot of the other things fall around me and not paying as much attention. Maybe I should go back to being a little bit busier. Both of those routes, I think, lead to disaster if we're trying to hit our goals, if that's a fair statement to use. How would you address both of those individuals, person A, person B, how would you address those to get started today on the right path toward what you guys are trying to teach people and really master their day and and time blocking and everything that we're mentioning here? All right. There's two or three elements to that. I mean, because they're general and I I love that. One is when people make a commitment to themselves, right? They know that they want to do their one thing and they just can't make it happen. And I think they really need to look hard at why they want to do that thing and how committed they are. In my mind, when someone is truly committed to something, they feel more empowered to say no to other stuff, right? And so I think sometimes we have to do a little exercise to remind ourselves why this is important. And one of the the exercises I've walked people through, let's just take, uh, you know, they're really successful, they got all this stuff going on, but they know that they're, they're overweight and it's not getting better. And so you can walk them down a path where, you know, you look at your present, and there is not a pleasant feeling like, okay, I'm overweight. Now let's go out in the future. If you allow this per- to persist for another five years, how are you going to feel about this thing that you're allowing to persist in your life? How will you feel? And will there be consequences for you and the people you love? And you let people sit on that for a second. Mm-hmm. And then you pull them back, right? Because that's not a pleasant place to be. Because usually the reason we're not changing today is the consequences today or this week are not bad enough to make us want to change. Right. But if you project five years into the future, now I'm thinking about like with the weight example, diabetes, right? Or my wife will leave me because I'm a fat slob or right. I mean, there's usually bigger consequences out in the future. Right. But because the future feels distant and we're not connected to it, it has no power over us today. So I usually go out and then come back and say, now imagine again, that today you made a commitment to start chipping away at it. No matter how small the progress was, you're going to make a tiny bit of progress every week. And I've seen people literally set a goal of losing like a quarter of a pound or a half pound a week. And that actually is a really sustainable path, right? It's not painful, whatever. Now go out five years, add all of that up, and how would you feel about that outcome? And so usually our motivation to make a behavioral change in our life We love the idea of losing that weight and looking good in a bathing suit, right? Right. The pleasure principle is awesome. And there's really high success-minded people that are in a groove. They can just do it for that. But most of us, we have to go to the pain place. So I'm not doing my one thing at work. I'm not selling enough in sales. It's novel. You name it, right? I'm not spending enough time with my kids, right? I'm I'm not going to have a relationship with them. And by the way, in five years, they may be out of the house. So you go through those areas you identify the pain. You say, what does that look like when it really persists? And I want people to get that in tune with their sense. And that usually gives them, wow, if I don't do something about this, I'm going to be really unhappy in the future if I'm alive. Like, Because some people, there's life or death consequences to this. It's really kind of oh, scary. Sure. So you go there, you go ahead, and, and I know that feels negative, but that's what I hold on to. If you look at my goal sheet, I've got up there to be the best father and husband I can be. Because when I had all the chips down, it's a long story, I had a project, I really did not wanna give my best. My wife turned to me when I told her how I was gonna approach it, and she says, it sounds like you're gonna mail it in, um, (laughs) and you tell your wife and family that you're a writer. And it was, oh, brutal, I'm, I'm, I'm choking up. And she didn't mean it, she just, you know, she just doesn't have a filter, right? But I was really gonna mail it in, oh yeah. But I realized in that moment, and this is so cheesy, that the thing that ultimately motivates me is that I never want to lose the respect of my wife, and I never want to set that bad example for my kids. And so your motivation is different from mine, but that's more of a universal one that I've learned to tap into. But I go to that pain, like, all right, so I really don't want to work on this thing. Well, there's something bigger at stake than what I'm doing today. It's a pattern of behavior where I could lose the respect of my spouse or set a horrible example for my children. And the consequences of those things are places I don't even want to visit. So that to me, number one, if you really say yes to something, it's no problem to say no to the other stuff. 
So I tap into the motivation first. Number two, I then look at the calendar and it's just what I said before, start small. You can't recreate your day overnight. Our research shows it takes about 66 days on average to form a habit. So I usually tell people, take that bite-sized chunk, whatever you're really sure that you can accomplish and take a 66 day challenge. And we have a calendar on our website. I've got a calendar on my door right now. I told you I was 90 days into my challenge because I knew that 66 days wasn't enough for me to make it a habit. And you pound that thing until it's automatic. And then you add to it or move on. And that truly is the, the giant success secret that nobody talks about. It's stupid simple. It's not easy. But you build a habit. You work for it until it works for you. And then you build on it and you stack it and you build on it and you build on it. And over time, people go, wow, you do all these really great things in the morning. And the truth is, it took you a few years to get there. But yeah, that's what it looks like. You stacked it and you added to it and you built on it. And progress is small and incremental. And you're in finance. It's compound interest, man. Yep. I'm just making a deposit every day. But there's this compounding thing going on. And over time, it gets bigger than you can imagine. Absolutely, Jay. And a couple of points you made in there uh, really stood out to me as some things that I've heard just, you know, a little bit different, but similar. I think it's uh, Stephen Covey that talks about imagine yourself when you're 80 years old or imagine yourself at, at your funeral. Who's going to be there? What are they going to say? It's just a similar idea of thinking about things in the future. Typically, we're not going to do any things as just, I would call for lack of better words, fickle, undisciplined human beings that try to walk around like we've got it all together, right? But we're typically just not going to do things that are monumental and that make a huge shift in our life unless something provokes us. And maybe that for you is teaching people how to think deeply about the next five years. This thing you're doing today that doesn't have a lot of consequence, what does it look like five years from now? Get them to envision that. But then look at your older self also and say, okay, where do I really want to be out there? That's just great, great advice. The other thing that I coach people toward a lot, especially my advisors here, because it is just such a brutal, just beat down job sometimes from the sense that it just takes time and people want things to happen right now. It takes time to build a career as, you know, anybody that's had success would tell you out mm -hmm. there. But I always tell people that they're, and it comes to planning as well with my own clients, but things are important. People would say financial planning mapping out your day, time blocking, anything that we can do to help us be successful in the future, they would say, oh yeah, that's really important. But it's not urgent. And until things become yep. urgent or the provoking nature, as I mentioned, a lot of times we're not going to do that. So I think for a lot of people, until they hit rock bottom and they lose a business or they lose a business partner relationship or they miss out on a big client or fill in the blank, whatever it is for you guys listening out there as you're driving around or working out or whatever you're doing, whatever that thing is that could potentially rock your world until that happens and things become urgent, many times we're not going to try to do the things that shift our habits and shift our thinking. And I hope your book really teaches a lot of people how to do that. I know it did me. And now it's the practical part of putting it in place, right? Because you give great advice in there, but we each have to own the responsibility as we go out each day and own our own lives for what we do. And we've got to go make it happen. You know, and I love that you ended there. I can tell that you're a coach and I'm a huge proponent of coaching. And you know, I think a lot of people, sadly, they wait until that event happens. And that's when they realize they need a coach is when they can't even afford one. And there's so many things like we shouldn't have to learn from our own mistakes when the world has, there's so many people we can learn from who have made <laughs> these mistakes and we don't have to repeat them. But I do think these little exercises that get us in tune with the consequences and then just take action. So I would challenge everybody, you know, listening to this, if you really want to make a difference this year, Chances are, when you've been listening to this, you kind of have already figured out like, gosh, I know I should be doing more of this. Figure out what of the many things we'd like to have happen in our life is the number one thing. And I usually just tell people to write them down. All right, I want to spend more time with my kids. I want to read a book every week, right? Boom, boom, boom. Well, now, if I can only do one of those things, what's it going to be? Usually it stands out. And if you can't, if there's two that are almost tied, just start with one. And I would make a commitment to this week maybe tomorrow, maybe today, start taking action towards forming a habit, however small it is, to make progress on that goal. And I just promise, I mean, I've seen it too many times, the moment people start seeing that positive results, one, wow, I did it. I actually did it, is the first positive. And then I did it two days in a row, and then I did it three days in a row. Wow, I'm actually doing it over time. That feedback loop and that halo effect will spread through your life. And it's just a very simple approach you can take to tackling all of the things that are most important to you. I would just say exactly like you're saying, let's get into action as fast as we can, however small, 
and experience success so we can make that a habit. Jay Papazan, thanks so much for your time here. I know there's a lot of other things that you've got on your plate, and uh, we look forward to your continued success in the future. And uh, above all things, just thank you for helping us all be better at the seemingly easy stuff, but that we have to go find ways to put it in place. I think that's what your book, The One Thing, uh, really does for us. I know that's what it did for me, and I'm so grateful to be able to push that out to our listeners. And I would encourage all of you guys to go out there and grab a copy of the book. You can buy it anywhere where book books are sold. It's all over the place. But you know, for this new year, that would be a perfect time for you guys to start off doing that. And I just can't speak highly enough about it. Jay, where can we push more traffic your way on the things that you're doing in uh, business and with your books and things like that? Where's the best uh, online or social media site that our listeners can go and find more about you? I think given our conversation, I would just encourage them to visit the one thing.com with the number one. And that's where all of our free resources are for people to take the dive, whether they read the book or not. I mean, I hope they will too. But We've described in this podcast everything they need to know to take the first step. And I would just take the free resources and get rolling. And if we've earned your trust from the results you get, then go back and read the book. But the one thing.com, we've got a calendar there with instructions. People can get started and start making a positive difference this year, this month, this week, today. Thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. And we'll be looking for greater success from you out there. Keep doing what you're doing and helping so many people. Thanks a lot, Jared. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey, guys, I enjoyed having Jay on the podcast today, and I hope you guys got a ton out of that just as I did. I hope you guys enjoyed the nuggets you took away from Jay in this message and encourage you to go grab the book, The One Thing, and start living a life with intention and design today on focusing on your priorities but getting really serious about the one priority that will make the most difference today and on into the future. If you want to connect directly with me, the best way to do that is email, which is info at success101podcast.com. Shoot a message over for any guest suggestions, thoughts about the show, content ideas, or anything else that you want to share about your progress and achievement this year. I cannot wait to hear how you're attacking the new year. If you'd like to connect with me in the world of social media, the best way to do that is on Facebook or Instagram under the name at Success 101 Podcast or even over on Twitter at Warren Jared. I hope you guys walk away from this motivated to get clear in your priorities as you find your one thing. And I'll catch you guys on the next episode of the Success 101 Podcast. Until then...